All right, folks, that was an interesting intro. I kind of like what Anchor put together and everything. So that was really cool, checking out what Anchor's got going on and uh, one of our uh, primary producers here. So I was really impressed with that. And, of course, we know that a lot of things are going on here in uh, the USA and things of that nature. Of course, the uh, Democrats had their convention last week, and uh, a number of folks have been talking about that over the last couple of weeks and seeing how their views are about a Biden-Harris potential administration. So we've been having those kind of conversations going on. But then in addition to that, we have also got today starting the Republican convention. So I understand that right here in North Carolina, I understand that Donald Trump might have landed earlier today and that he is definitely part of the Republican convention that will be taking place. I think I learned earlier today that he might be speaking all four days of the convention. I don't know the last time that that ever happened that a president spoke every day of his convention, but apparently that's something that's going on and we do know that with all that is going on in the world, sometimes new things happen and folks do things in a whole different kind of way. So that's going on. And then, of course, I was highly disappointed yesterday in one of the sports games that was going on because I am a sports fan. Do try to follow some of the things that are going on in the bubble. So I was watching the NBA game and was actually rooting for the Clippers. I have a personal bias because I went to college with Doc Rivers. So I was hoping that they were going to win and go up 3-1. But instead, it's a 2-2 series because one of the players that I believe is from overseas hit an amazing game-winning shot, and that means that they won by a point. So the Clippers and the Portland Trailblazers are all tied at two. There are some of the other series that are already over. They've been having some folks that got swept and things of that nature. So definitely have had that going on in the sports world. And of course, everybody is still talking about the virus and its impact on the school situation, because I do know that a number of universities here have tried to go into the whole version of being uh, actually in-person classes or a hybrid version and things of that nature. But now a few of them have gone back to the online form of doing things because that's what's going on in the world. And, you know, we still have in some cases that are going up. There have been clusters that have been found of people that have COVID and things of that nature. So that being said, that does mean that folks are having to reassess their school situation. So uh, definitely folks are doing that. And we're going to find out more about how that's going on with that. So I'm going to bring out at least one of my guests and everything. So I've got Ben Coates with Mogi's Media. He's over there in the UK. So I'm hoping I'm going to hear from others as well. He's part of my IBM.TV family and all of that. So usually sometimes if it's not as late where it is where he's at in London, we might see some of his kids running around, but we won't see them today because hopefully they're in bed asleep and maybe even preparing for school. He's shaking his head like, no, they're still up. They're still driving me crazy because that's what kids do and everything. Told you I don't have any of those. I've got nephews and I can like send them back to their brother whenever I want to. So I don't have to like have them in the regular day to day kind of aspect. So, um, Ben, are they going to school there in uh, London? Because I'm not sure what's going on with the school situation there. I don't think what the UK is. We're not due back for another week yet for our summer holiday break. So about the middle of next week, they start going back. There's a lot of pressure. Uh, on the education secretary in the UK to get them back. Uh, The the worry is, I don't think there's a worry about children with with the the coronavirus, but I think the worry is with the teachers. And Mm -hmm. so the the teacher unions are concerned. But of course, you have to balance that because unions are there to get better deals for their teachers. And that may include not getting the teachers back as soon as they should do. So it's a difficult situation. It's a balanced act as everything is. It's it's a little bit... um, give and take, which not either side is willing to do. But, uh, yeah, so it is going to be difficult over the next couple of weeks, and we're not going to know the true impact, really, until late September, if there is going to be an impact. We're having local lockdowns in, in the UK. Uh, Birmingham, which many people know, is is about to uh, possibly go on local lockdown. That's the next the, – the mayor of the West Midlands is very worried about that. So, yeah, we're, but it is what it is in the UK. You know, you can – Stay in your four walls and you can avoid it or you can go outside and take sensible precautions. So the UK is slowly picking up. uh, But, of course, what happened was the start of July, the UK economy picked up. And then the slowdown from the six-week holiday came because we have a six-week school break. But the slowdown came from a low position. So the actual slowdown this year really is slow. So we'll see. It's a big time between September and Christmas, I think. 
Yep, definitely a big time here as well. And like I said, I know that one of my uh, brother's uh, my, my brother's girlfriend's uh, daughter is going to one of our local colleges, and that's one of the colleges that flipped to going online because she had actually gone up to the university. I need to talk to her, him today and maybe even get in touch with her and see whether she's going to do it online there in Greenville, Greenville, North Carolina, or whether she's going to actually come back home and do her online classes from around here in Durham. But, yeah, we are having folks that are making those kind of decisions and everything along those lines. You know, one of the things that I've always been curious about, and I know that there was a time frame here, and I've got some friends that are engaged in union activism. There's a thing called the Fight for 15, where they want to get $15 an hour for our um, workers in the fast food industry and things of that nature. Now, I do know that historically speaking, London and England was somewhat of a union country, but I don't know what it is now. So are the unions still very strong there in London or have y'all kind of gone away from unions? Because unions, uh, there are some very strong unions here in America, like the teachers union, like, of course, the gun lobby and things of that nature. So uh, I was just curious about <clears throat> from your perspective of uh, how the unions are perceived there in London and around the rest of England. I'm actually part of the National Union of Journalists in the United Kingdom. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a unionist member myself. Unfortunately, the unions seem to be uh, strong when the Conservatives are in government and when Labour are in the government, they have a lot more control over what's going on. But, of course, we have, I mean, we, we've got so many levels of unions. So we've got Unite the Union, which is which is across a lot of businesses and just definitely back its members, the people on the ground back its members. Uh, and now, but we have a union called the P- PFA, the Professional Footballs Association, and that union is frowned upon because the uh, the union, the head of the union, is on millions of pounds a year, has been in post for many, many years. Which, of course, you shouldn't be in a union, um, and it represents people that are earning two, three, four hundred grand a week. Do they need a union? They've got re- agents, so there is that. And the, the football in the UK has just tried to bring in price caps for the a couple of lower divisions and the first thing the union have done is go no that's illegal it might it might be a matter of, of conversation but is it going to save clubs and at the minute yes it is going to save clubs having a price cap so so you can have unions for good you can have unions for bad but whatever union it is it's run by people who are probably getting more money than most of its members so it is a bit of an upside down term so but i mean obviously the conservatives are currently in government so yeah, yeah, the unions are quite strong and have a lot to say. And, of course, we've just been through something called Corbynism uh, with Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader. Um, and uh, and now we've got a bit more of a stronger Labour leader in terms of standing up to the union. So so they, they've been, their nose have been pushed out a little bit at the moment. Yeah, that's interesting to know because, like I said, you were even talking about the sports and football. So those that are watching and might be more American-based and everything, when Ben and the rest of the world talks about football, he's talking about what we call soccer. But definitely that's kind of what he's meaning and everything when he's talking about football. But we do know that here, American football uh, – and that kind of stuff has always been about the athletes unions and those kind of agreements that you were just mentioning that I guess the soccer players are trying to get. And I didn't even realize that there was a lot of those kind of unions with like the Manchester's and some of the soccer teams that exist there and everything, or the more traditional word of football around the rest of the world. But I was just wondering, have the unions always been that big or were they kind of like the sports unions that is, or were they kind of following the model of the U S sports teams where the unions are so big, whether it's baseball, whether it's basketball or whether it's football. The soccer, as you call it, soccer union, uh, it's bigger when there's money to be made. If I'm honest, it is one of the unions that is frowned upon by many, many of the, the general man and, and lady in the street. Um, yes, it, and and what's happened in the UK is as the the, the general unions have, have seemingly shrunk and got smaller, and people aren't because obviously the factories have, have died off, you know, and stuff. Yeah. So there's no need to be part, perceived to be no need to be part of a union. The actual sports union has actually risen, the football union, so because uh, the money's there. I pay my fees to the Union of Journalists, one, because it, it's it's credibility, mm-hmm. and two, it's like your house insurance. I don't particularly want to use it, but if I do need it, it's there, and I've paid for it monthly rather than employing legal beagles for thousands of pounds, etc. So, so yeah, so I, I still believe unions have a role to play. I don't think it's the role they had in the 80s and 90s when, they, you know, the factories were packed and you used to have factory union meets on the floor. However, at the moment, with the amount of redundancies that are going on, 
they are vital in negotiating them down because they're still going to be redundancies whether they're negotiating or not, but no, no, reducing them and also the payoffs for the people that are leaving. So, so yeah, it is it is a key time for unions, and it's about it, it's this is where they need to really step up because I don't think in two thousand eight they really did step up into the into the breach when the recession was on. They were certainly not as uh, as PR savvy as they are now. So we'll see, we'll see. But of course, like like you in the states, we won't really know the impact of coronavirus for another two or three months. Yeah, you're right about that. I'm hearing some folks, even in the entertainment industry, talking about that they're afraid. I know you've done some work in that field as well, that they're afraid that they may not see big events. I mean, they might see the smaller events, like some of the smaller concerts and some of those things. But they're saying that they might not see any even in 2021, which is next year. And they're projecting possibly to 2022 or 2023. I hope that they're wrong in that case, because like you, I've done some events and I've done some event oriented work. So I definitely would like to see the event space come back. But unfortunately, it doesn't look like that's happening right now. So I don't know what your perception is of that. But definitely that's one of my Concerns is one that has done some really big events, but uh, I just don't know what your perception is because I know that in addition to being a journalist, you've also done some event work. Yeah, uh, the biggest the biggest indicator for me is that the Conservatives have cancelled their autumn conference in October. Now, if the Conservative Party are not going to step up, who are in power, are not going to step up and do their conference, that's quite worrying. We have we were due back on August the 1st for test events for indoor because at the minute I don't think many people outside have got an issue. I think they're quite comfortable being outside. As long as people are sensible, you can always walk away from somebody outside. It's a little bit easier. Inside, there's a lot of masked people and, and et cetera and taking you know sensible precautions. But we're dealing with people, so there's people that aren't taking precautions. And, of course, they're the problem people that you need to you know avoid, which isn't easy indoors. But April, August the 1st, we meant to bring back test events. That got delayed till August the 15th, and this is mainly for business and conferences, and that's with a view of restarting the indoor scene for October the 1st. The pro- so there is some exhibitions planned in October that I know of. There's two locally, which I intend to, to well, one I'm part of as, as the media and another one that I intend to, uh, intend to attend. But if that doesn't go ahead, thinking about it and thinking about a normal run, if these don't go ahead, we're going to lose it for another six months because November... Uh, December, January is obviously Christmas party time. Well, if there's nothing gone on prior, how can you have a Christmas party? That's not going to be the first thing you bring back. And then January and February really is 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 a build up for the March events, and then springtime you get loads loads of them. So I'm really, I mean, I'm desperate for them to come back, but I'm really worried that if we miss out now, we're going to be dead in the water for another six months. Yeah, I hope that you're wrong, and I hope that the rest of the folks are wrong as well, because I definitely would like to see some events happening in 2021 and even early 21. But even like a film festival that I'm involved in, I think that they're trying to plan possibly to have it in February as a last event and everything, but they are looking at the contingency that it could have to be a virtual festival. So, uh, like I said, I know a number of the planners are hoping that it won't be strictly virtual, that it will be having some live components of some sort or another. But that oftentimes fascinated by that. One of the other questions that I know some folks might be curious about, and I was just wondering your perception of this and, and everything, is I work for a measurement, which is a uh, testing company, a grading testing company. And I remember we did some research in about London and the early days of London and things of that nature. And I remember that one of the things that I probably think created part of the union movement in uh your country and everything was child labor. So I just was wondering how is child labor being treated now? Is it still an issue within London or is it something that is not much of that much of a problem? We know that you got your kids working regularly, yeah. but that yeah. doesn't count, but I'm talking about as a general society. Generally, I, I still, I still think there's two sides to this. Yes. There's of course, uh, asking the, the, the kids to do things for no reason at all. There's also an education side. And I certainly want my ladies to do paper rounds as soon as they can. One, so they can start handling money. And two, because it doesn't good to get out to work. So, the, But, of course, that's a balanced argument. Right. There, there is very little, fr- from what we know, um, perceived child labour. You know, There's no more going around the mines or anything at, at, at 12, 13, 14 like there used to be. But, of course, you can then go the other way where they don't want to work. They want to stay in education because it's easier. Um, so we, we, but the problem I've got at the moment is we've lost, two, we've lost the 2008 generation twice now. 
We lost them during that recession, which we've never really fully recovered, if we're honest. And of course, when the recession hit in 08 and 09, a lot of them said, we're going to university for three years, takes you to 2012. You've got the Olympics and that obviously that boosts the economy a touch in London. And then you've got eight years of finding a job, et cetera. And then bang, they're out of work again. And then, of course, we've lost the generation. We could, we're in danger of losing the 2020 generation because they can't even get the exam results right to, so they can move forward. But then, of course, a lot of wait to see if they go to uni or their uni results, et cetera. So I, I'm really worried about youth, youth unemployment and the, and, the, and the way that youth are going to come through because we need to protect our own jobs first. There's, the natural, natural instinct, Mark, is to say, I need to keep my job. I need to keep my business up and running. That's the first thing because without businesses, there is none. But saying that, and, and just going back to, to another point of yours, there was actually, because I live in Shropshire, which is in the middle of, of, of the UK, we did, uh, there was actually a Shropshire virtual show the weekend. And there was lots of things like dog shows, et cetera, which had been pre-recorded, but ran through the day. There was a main stage and the main stage was actually in the centre and was live. They had a small audience of what they could have. I would guess it was family and friends. Obviously, I didn't know who was in the audience. They had bands there. There was three bands that played as well. Uh, and then also each business around could pay, I think it was £35, so just the cost of a meal, to have their stand virtually on the screen. And I know that a couple actually sat there all day in front of a video and people could then tune into that video and talk to the people. So it's a bit of a hybrid event, um, a bit of live and a bit of a bit of virtual. And it worked. It worked. They raised £20,000 for charity, five charities. Now, the unknown aspect of that, of course, is cost. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, and, and, and if, if they've made any money or if they've used it as marketing, because you can't obviously allocate it as marketing, the organiser, and what are, are the gains going to get out of it? So, but of course, this is moving away from what the unions are used to, because the unions are used to employment, etc. So, bringing it back to your point is that the unions wouldn't be involved in such things like that. Um, but yeah, it was interesting. It was interesting. It, it, it worked to a degree. How how well it worked? I know that one of my friends got two a couple of orders on the day, uh, but it wouldn't have covered the cost of a stand. But of course, going forward, we won't know what 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 she gets from other things. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, like I said, there's just so many things that folks are just now learning about uh, London and things of that nature. So like I said, I know we're a global network, so I'm trying to give a little bit of the knowledge of London to the rest of the world as well. So that being said, uh, for those that are watching, like from the United States and everything else, and I had one of my guests on the show or one of my shows before that was used to live in London and they now live in New York, but they were talking about their view of the monarchy and their view of the parties. Now you talk about the labor and the conservative party. I'm thinking that that would be like our version of the Democrats and the Republicans, but I think y'all have more than two parties, if I remember correctly. So can you just, for those that are watching that don't know the London politics and even the monarchy, could you talk about one, is the monarchy even uh, respected that much in England anymore? And or by the common citizens and also how the party system works. Yes, the Queen the Queen is still a very, very much loved um, monarchy, and many people do respect her. Other parts of the monarchy are not quite as well as respected as, as I'm sure you're aware from uh, stories in America. Um, uh, but yes, the, the, the Queen herself is very much respected. Uh, Prince William uh, is respected. Prince Harry has had his own issues, of course, that we all know about, and he's come over to the States with Meghan. And whatever side you sit on of, of that argument, um, it's up to the two, the couple themselves. Prince William's very much a traditional royalist and follows follows the line. So yeah, the Queen does oversee us all. We've then got Parliament, and at the moment we've got the Conservatives who have a hefty majority in Parliament. Uh, there is other parties. So we have the Liberal Democrats, um, which obviously the name speaks for themselves as to what they are, and they're probably more aligned to um, to your towards your Democratic Party, although they're nowhere near as big as your Democratic Party, of course. And then we have we have nationalist parties. So we have the Scottish Nationalist Party, the Welsh Nationalist Party, which is called Plaid Cymru, um, and we have many many uh, elements in Ireland. And of course, you all know about the Irish troubles that we've had. So you've got uh, you know many parties over there, uh, the DUP, Sinn Fein, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, ongoing. So we are quite a diverse. Um, different areas of, of politics and it, it is good it, it does make a hell of a difference the SNP I, I don't particularly agree with their politics but I do admire them for being so passionate about Scotland uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm a great believer in the UK in the kingdom in the, in the, the kingdom itself and the union uh, they don't seem to be they want independence 
but at least they're, they're consistent. One thing that I don't like in politics is inconsistency because they should right. be the, the politics. And then what happens in our parliament is that the, 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 the parliament will process the bills. It will then go to be seen by the House of Lords, to be overseen mm-hmm. by the House of Lords. Now, the House of Lords, is, it's, not, it's got no uh, sway. It's more of a checking system. And there's a lot of legal beagles in there. There's a lot of good business people in there. And although they're party political, they do seem to sit on the fence a lot. So they will pass things back to, to Parliament and say, have you looked at this? Now, there is when it's time limited, there is something that the Lords can do is debate it until the, lot, the time runs out, which is uh, something that they're prerogative, but very rare they do, including over Brexit. Uh, where they didn't debate the bill uh, and they sent it, they did uh, pass it straight through. And then the bill, once the House of Lords is checked, that's the Queen's check in, the angus to the Queen for royal assent. Oh, wow. So the, the folks don't know that about London and everything. So just out of curiosity, what is the average man's view in London of what's going on in the United States? They see this person that we've got in the White House and they see this person, but I just wondered among your circle of friends, what's the view of what's going on in the United States? I okay. The truth is, nobody knows what the politics is, and that's the truth of it, Mark. Nobody understands what the politics are that are going on because it's a one man show. <laughs> now, for balance, you may feel he's right, you may feel he's wrong. The problem is, you can't tell because it's not about the policies, it's not about the bills going through, it's all about him himself, and this is the issue that people have got. Now, my worry for, for, for America is is that you're coming to a big election, and it's very rare you change after four years, looking back at the records. Right. Um, I, I, usually the, the president lasts eight years. The worrying thing for me is, are you going to vote because Biden's right for the country, or are you going to vote because Biden's better than Trump? Now, right. if he's better than Trump, is that a reason for him to be president? Now, I'm not trying to say it is or isn't, but you can see where, what I'm saying. Um, and I know from uh, from Bill's roundups on here, uh, there's a lot of people that are unsure. And the bigger hitters seem to be coming out and aren't actually the candidates. Now, obviously, the Republican convention starts today, but I know from the Democrat convention, the big hitters weren't Biden. It was his vice president. It was uh, President Obama. Uh, right. You know, it was people like that. That looking from the outside in is quite worrying that we've seen very little about what Biden said. And yet mm. Biden's going to be the president. So whatever the the the, the shortage in uh, in the, the politics at the moment in the States, are the shortages still going to be there, whoever gets in? Of course, it depends how short you are as to, to right. but it's not it's not really the, the way it seems at the moment is they're not you're not really coming from a strong position. And the the thing is, is that the world is suffering now because we need the states. Right. You know, we, we do need the United States to be to be on the ball, to be leading. You, you've leads of the free world. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it does feel at the moment that the infighting is taking over. It does seem to be bitter at times. And I know politics is politics and we always have bitterness. But right. at the moment, everybody should be working together to get through the crisis, the coronavirus crisis. And that's yeah. one thing that the UK Parliament has done, Mark, is that Labour leader Keir Starmer has backed Boris Johnson on many, many things. And mm. it's lovely to see. He doesn't agree with him. He doesn't, uh, he's a diff, totally different politician. But when going through this, there does seem to be communication lines. And I don't think there's a communication line between people in the Republican Party, never mind between the Republicans and Democrats. Um, so it's, it's worrying and it's, it's the worst time ever that you could go through what you're going through. And, of course, who suffers? The citizens. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, that's who suffers. And I'm just um, one of the other things I just being a student of history and everything is I know that a lot of times people talk about Black Lives Matter and things of that nature now, but we're going through this era of um, kind of like race relations and things of that nature. I know that y'all have also gone through similar things in England and London and all of that kind of the part of the community. I was just wondering how are things being done in terms of cultural relationships in London now? I know not just with Black Lives Matter, but just like there's a significant African population that lives in London now. There's other populations, like I know some Asians that live in London now. So I'm just wondering, in your view, how is race relations and cultural relations in London now compared to either in the past or in the, the present? If, if you ignore all the Twitter storm and you ignore all the social media storm, 
I don't I, look. There is obviously issues, and I'm not belittling the issues at all. But I don't think the UK is in the worst position to move forward on it. Uh, and if you think about the protests that went on across the world, they came from what happened to George Floyd. They never really come because of a case in the UK. Now, uh, you, of course, I'm not, I, you know, you talk to the wrong the wrong person because obviously, you know, my personal race relations are brilliant, you know, and, and everything like that, and, and I don't see. Uh, race, colour, or anything. I just see, see people, as you know, from from being on many shows on here. But a, the the problem you get is that we had an incident recently with one of our Labour members um, of Parliament who filmed an incident when they were stopped, uh, stopped and searched, and she put it on, and the video was mirrored, mirrored, so it looked like she was at the driver's side. Now I'm not saying she mirrored it, but I'm yeah. saying somebody mirrored it. We could have been the press, of course. She wasn't. She was the passenger side. Now, on the video, it does look as if the driver is a white person. Mm. Now, um, so who was stopped and searched? Was it the driver? Was it this person? Does the camera not show this person's true colour? I don't know. You know, but, but, but when it gets distorted... You don't know the truth. And this is the problem, is that people are grabbing it and not coming out. It's like, and of course, does saying that a white policeman shot a black man, does that not add fuel to the fire? Is it not? Is it not allegedly a corrupt policeman shot a citizen or a, a member of the public? Does that not come across better? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But... I mean, the actual Black Lives Movement is very powerful. The football have picked it up, the cricket have picked it up, and I I love that. It's fantastic. But unfortunately, far, far wings of parties pick it up and it gets distorted immensely then, and the actual message gets lost. Because, you know, I'm in business, uh, you know, and I trade with people. I don't trade with, with, like you say, a black man. I don't trade with a white man. I trade with a person. And and I trade with people I like. Um, and, and I don't see why people can't just do that, um, you know, and, and things like that. I, I, I don't know why they can't just deal with people and, and see that. But obviously, you're not born racist. Right. You know, you're not born racist. It, you, 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 it's installed in you. Now, there is institutionalised racism, as, and, and the Michael Holden, I'm a big cricket fan, so uh, right. I watched the Michael Holden interview when he absolutely burst down in tears and things he'd been through. But the problem is, Mark, is that we're trying to eradicate history and not learn from history. So pulling down pulling down a statue has no relevance. It has no relevance whatsoever. It might make the people pulling it down feel better, but then what do we tell our kids? Slavery didn't happen. It did happen. Yeah. What we need to say is slavery happened. It was wrong because effectively we were, we're bringing people over from, from mostly the West Indies and, and countries like that into yeah. our country because they were black and they were cheap and we treated them like that. And that's what we called slavery. Now, right. tell many kids like that? And if your kids are brought up the right way, they will say, well, that's wrong. They'll say, yes, it was, but it happened. And pulling down a statue is not going to stop that happening. Keeping the statue there and asking me about the statue might allow me to educate you on why it was wrong and what you can do to put it right. So, I'm very, I, I do, I, you know, is, is there anything, the messages are getting lost in this, unfortunately. And, and of course, the biggest key is, is that we, we are, you know, we need to move forward. We need to move on. Uh, we need to accept our cultures, um, you know, and, and there's nothing better than learning other cultures. There's nothing better than, than listening to other people from other countries. I, I'm a great believer that you, you're brought up where you're brought up. And then if when you grow up to the, the, the late teens, the early 20s, if you want to go and see the country, go uh, the world, go and see it. But that, but I like to ask people about their own culture because there's parts of that that I'd like to bring to, to ours. It's all about mixing experiences and improvement. But, of course, as I say, when it becomes a political message, that's very dangerous because it's uh, nothing's right about anything if, if it's your side of the story. Unfortunately, there's good on both sides, there's bad on both sides, and this is what we need to, to we need to eradicate the bad and learn on the good on both sides. Yeah, that's very true. We definitely need to do that on a uh, regular basis. One of the other things that I know I'm just kind of curious about is um, the whole thing with climate control, because I know that a lot of folks are paying attention to climate there in London, because a lot of folks, when they think of London, they think, of course, like certain parts of the United States and its pollution, but then they also think about London and its pollution. So I was just wondering, as a one that's been involved in the political spectrum and the media spectrum, how do you feel y'all are doing with climate control? 
Well, firstly, can we get rid of spokespeople for the airlines? That would help mm-hmm. immensely. Okay, that, that would sort out a lot of the climate control problems because how airline people can sit there and say, I need bailing out because when we get to pre-COVID levels, we're not. We're never, ever going to get back to pre-COVID levels of flight, of flight for the density of people we have in the world because people won't fly over to the States for an exploratory meeting. The exploratory meeting there will be held through Zoom, et cetera, or whether they like it or not. So if the deal's to be done and I need to come and sit with you, I will come and sit with you and do the deal. If it's an exploratory meeting, I don't need to fly over, spend four or 500 quid, put the, the world at risk because there's never been a better time environmentally. The air out there is fantastic. And you, you only have to see the pictures from around the world. But, of course, you get the airline people who are willy bathing out. Well, hold on, you, you own your own island. Some of them do you know, et cetera. So why is he bailing out? But of course, again, we, it's back to the same message. It gets, the, the message gets overtaken and we have extin, extin, Extinction Rebellion who have taken a very powerful message and have taken it to a level where they're affecting people going to work. You lose, you, you lose your, your, your message then. You can't do that. I understand, you know, people climbing onto tubes at seven in the morning. Firstly, People need to get to work to earn a living. Secondly, it's dangerous. Yeah. You know, and I've seen people pulling people off tubes, etc. You've seen people gluing themselves. There has to be better ways. Hopefully, and if there's one good thing that can come out of the coronavirus crisis, it is the climate. It is the message that we don't need to fly everywhere. We don't need to be in the car. We can walk a lot more. We need to be healthier. Um, and that's really should be the message. Now, of course, the politicians at the moment are, 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 have commercially can see a vaccine. You know that this all their, their focus is on this. So of course, the climate message is being missed. So the 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 the, the, the groups the, the groups that push it do need to continue pushing the message. But they need to push it in a better way. It doesn't affect the day to day person going to work, etc. Yeah, definitely. Um, could you talk a little bit about for those who are just learning about you and everything about um, the whole concept of Moogie's Media and what Moogie's Media is about? Because, like I said, who knows? We might find you some clients here in North Carolina or in other parts of the states or just globally. Because we definitely know that you are a global company and want folks to know more about you. So we'll get away from the politics for a minute and get folks yeah. to know a little bit about you and what Moogie's Media is all about. Yeah, Moogie's Media, Moogie, Moogie's Media is a company that uh, we're drone pilots. We've got what's called the Permission for Commercial Operations from the CAA, the Civil Aviation Authority in the UK. We do a lot of work with the drone, etc. And also what we, we tend to do is we tend to go and take materials for people at events. Um, so there's nothing – because a, a good event organiser shouldn't have time to go around taking pictures and videos. They should be that busy looking after people. And the majority of them are. Of course they are. Um, so we go there, we do a lot of interviews with people on site so we can get their, uh, their scale, you know, the way they're enjoying the event. And obviously the best testimonial is people at the event. We do a lot of pictures. Um, so we've just recently done a six-week drive-in and we took pictures at every show. And they've gone to the organiser. We've used them, our, used them ourselves as well. Uh, and that's and also videos. So we've just done a lot of holiday places that use things like booking.com are coming off booking.com at the moment because they've realized that these sites take a lot of money. So they're building their own websites. And of course they'll need a video to show off their, their uh, facilities. Um, so yeah, so we do a lot of that. We do a lot for other video companies as well. So editing the footage that they take, uh, we've actually do a lot in the agricultural world. So at the minute I've just done, finished off a, a nasal spray for cows this week. So that was a, a fascinating one. Um, uh, so yeah, so we if, if the material, of course, you can see some of the pictures that we've got here on the wall here um, that we've taken. Uh, horse racing, we do a lot of horse racing in the UK. Uh, that's a drone picture. Got to have pictures of my girls up, of course. Uh, oh, there's another another horse racing one. That's Capella. For those that remember the '90s dance band Capella, uh, they performed in Shropshire recently. Uh, I'm being a '90s child myself, obviously that helps. So uh, so yeah, that's what we do. We gather materials for people. Uh, and then we, 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 we pass them back to the organisers and also use them for our, our own marketing too. And what's the most unusual drone picture that you've taken? Because I know here in the States, I think that there are certain laws and rules about drone and everything. I've actually got like one of those little mini drones that I think I've had fly one time and I need to get it out and play with it a little bit more. But it's just like basically a toy drone. It's not the expensive drone that I think I might have paid like uh, under $100 for it, if that. But 
it was definitely a toy drone. But what are the rules there, and uh, what's the most interesting picture you've had with your drones? Oh, that's a great question. This is this one's off a hill called the Reekin, which is a local hill, and you get some great views there. Actually, one of the best, one of the funniest videos I did on the Reekin, there was meant to be a fire, so I shot over there in my drone to try and get pictures of the fire. Uh, not pictures, videos of the fire. And, of course, that would help the emergency services gather where it was. I couldn't find a fire. It was one of these localised, very localised barbecue on the, on the floor fire. But I got some dramatic pictures of birds and hang gliders. So it, I didn't go looking for that. Uh, but this week there's a, a ship that's actually docked at somewhere called Moston Docks called HMS Lancaster. Uh, the Duke, and, and I'm going up there to, to, to fly over that. So I'm looking forward to that because it's, just, it's, it's a, a ship from, from the – I think it's from the 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 twentieth century, and it's just moored there. It's not even in the docks itself, so I'm going to fly over that as well. But I mean, you, you know, I do uh, the horses as well. Do it over the horse, uh, over the horses, etc., and things like that. So you just never know. And I never delete a photo until I have a look at it on the screen because you just never know what you're picking up. Uh, but yeah, at the minute it's probably the hang gliders and birds when I went looking for a fire. So it sounds just, good. Some interesting pictures and everything. Need you to stick around and everything because we're going to continue the conversation. But I've also got an e-commerce lady here with me as well. So don't know how popular e-commerce is over there in uh, England and London, but we've got Veronica Jeans who's with us, and she's all about e-commerce and things of that nature. So, Veronica, glad that you were able to join us. Tell us a little bit about this exciting book that you've got and about e-commerce, and is it popular there in London. Do you have e-commerce clients in London? Because I've got Ben Coach with me, and he's part of yeah. the IBM.TV family, and he's definitely uh, involved in media. So, Veronica, glad that you could join us. I'm just going to center myself here a little bit. Okay. So, <laughs> so um, the book. So, the book is all about, um, if you don't know anything about um, getting your Shopify store online is you've got to read the book and you'll get your store online. Um, it is all about getting your products online and starting an e-commerce store, starting a business. And so I did it because my clients kept asking the same questions over and over again. And I thought, well, you know, let me make some videos and then um, so hear the videos, do this and then come back. And then I thought, well, you know, if they need videos, maybe they'll learn better if it's written down so that's how the book started and um so uh yeah you know and yes i have clients all over the world in fact i am originally from namibia i'll say it slowly namibia and um <clears throat> and i have uh, some minions in namibia um shopping online in africa is still a hit and a miss but they're getting there and a client in New Jersey, the island of New Jersey, she's got a retail store, an online store, and also somebody, I think, in Holland. I'm not so sure. Oh, no, Berlin, Berlin, sorry. So, yeah, oh, wow. I mean, you know, if you're online, you, anybody can shop from you, and, you know, you can you have customers across the world if you are willing to ship to different countries, right? Yep. And that's actually one of the things that I know one of our other IBM.TV shows was saying, because this is Financial Monday, they do a lot of conversations around finances on Monday. And one of our founders, Nick Valveda, was actually talking about, um, with some of his guests, Bitcoins earlier today. And I don't know how you as an e-commerce person feel about Bitcoins. And then I'd also love to hear from Ben his thoughts on Bitcoins as well. But we'll start with you, Veronica, since you're doing e-commerce. But what are your thoughts about Bitcoins as a tool for e-commerce? Well, you know, my philosophy is give your clients any way to pay you. Bottom line, if they have money, give them an opportunity to pay you. So whether it's Amazon Pay, PayPal, Bitcoin, EFT that they normally do in Europe and Africa, they do EFTs which directly into your account. I don't care how they pay you. They just need to pay you and buy your products. Yeah. What's your take on that, Ben? Yeah, the best customer is the one that pays you, Veronica, definitely. Uh, and the worst, the worst one is it doesn't. I, I totally agree with you there. I, I, I'm, I'm sceptical. I'm sceptical about Bitcoin. Um, I don't think that the, the banking system we have will allow it to become as big as people say it will. I do think the people that um, that are pushing it are do seem to be pushing in, in that respect and do seem to be uh, 
take a bottle of Luke's aid before they come on and talk about it, that kind of scenario, <laughs> which just put people off. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so I, I don't... And also, it's a trade, and trades go up and down. You never hear about Bitcoin coming down. You only ever hear about it going up. And, and I know people that have lost thousands and thousands of pounds as it comes down, but you yes. never hear about that. And, and that, that's worrying as well. It's a, If we're honest, it's another share, stock and share. That's what it is. Yeah. That's what it generally is. And and you know one now it's, it's it, you know it needs to be controlled because I have friends also that lost their shirt, and there were a lot of scams in the beginning you know that they bought into and so now they're hoping and like hell it goes up again, and you know what if it's not controlled you'll get the scammers in you'll get people in that are trying to make a lot of money immediately, and you know I you know <clears throat> I was just in fact in this morning in my workshop I go you know. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, baby. You can't, you can't want to become rich overnight. And I find that Bitcoin people, I don't know how to call them, but they tend to go, wow, oh, we can make a million bucks, you know, and off we go, and we're going to make so much money. We've heard it all before. You know, it's just like, no, that's not how the world works. That's very true and everything. Like I said, Ben has done a number of businesses. He's involved in media. He's involved in other businesses as well. So, Veronica, as one who does e-commerce, what would be your advice for the reason that somebody should even start an e-commerce business? Because, like I said, there are a number of folks that want to get involved in commerce in general. They want to be business owners, but I don't know that they always think about e-commerce. So what would be the reason that you would give somebody to even think about putting their business as an e-commerce business? Well, First off, you know, you have to be online. We're in a virtual world. Everybody is online. And thank you, Amazon has made it very popular to shop online. If you have any inclination of selling anything, you have to have an e-commerce. And the e-commerce is different to a marketplace. As I said, like Amazon is you own your e-commerce business. Amazon, you rent space. And they can shut you down in a heartbeat. The same with Etsy, the same with Walmart, eBay, any of these other Facebook marketplaces where you can open a store. It's a, it's renting space. You know, you have to have your own business. And in e-commerce, um, if you open your store on an e-commerce platform, that is your business. And why to start? I don't know. Just, you know, everybody shops. Everybody shops online, you know. Um, and if you don't do it now... It's just going to become more and more popular. And so, so Walmart is opening up. So we've got to separate the, the two, Walmart store, and then there's Walmart Marketplace is starting up now and going to be competition to, um, to, to Amazon. is another place where, you can, <clears throat> where people can shop. So everybody is, you know, if you're not online, you're going to die on the vine, baby. Well, that makes a lot of sense. What are some of the things that have surprised you about e-commerce? And uh, that's for you, Veronica. And then for you, man, is there any of your products, because you've been involved in a number of media, are any of your things in an e-commerce platform? And if so, which ones are they on? So I'll start with you, Veronica, which is more of what got you involved in this and what made you decide that you wanted to be this e-commerce leader and everything. Well, you know, it, you know I've... I, I happened to fall into it. Somebody said I, I was going to sell something online after my last company and, you know, trying to trying to think of something to sell. I chatted to the sales guy at uh, 3D Cart and he said to me, hey, you know, you, you want to help a client? I go, why not? And for about three or four years, these clients kept dropping on my lap and that's how I started. And, you know, I'm, I've run a business most of my life in Holland and in, in South Africa. So, I'm sort of international and understand a lot about business. So, I mean, e-commerce basically is, is a business as well, you know. So I've got a lot of experience running my own company, made a few million as well. And um, so that, but what I enjoy about e-commerce is the possibilities of selling more than one product, right? I sell services. So, um, so even if you sell services, I'm on Shopify since I have to be since I'm selling, you know, the platform, but I sell my courses on Shopify, you know, so it's, it's a product, you know, so if you have a product, whether it's um, uh, digital or service, or you can actually sell something on, 
But then, you know, you have a service company. Why not sell chutzkits? You know, you can sell cups and all sorts of weird, wonderful things that, that you can supply to your customers. So I believe in residual income because just in case the one thing doesn't work out, you have something else. So <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Opportunities, right? Yeah. So, Ben, have you had any businesses with e-commerce? And then um, after Ben answers that question, I want to know whether Veronica's had any drones in her business. Because Ben, <laughs> in one of his businesses, he does drone pilotry. So I'll let Ben talk first, and then we're going to find out if we've had any drones that have been part of her clientele. But, Ben, it's on you first. I, I think e-commerce is actually a, a, a web, and, and, and I think that everybody should be um, – e-commerce savvy at least and i think it saves a lot of people a lot of money i do think that we, we spend a lot of money on things that we could do ourselves because we're the lazy culture um so i mean we've obviously got the old yell.com and if you go on in the uk and if you go on that site it tells you all the sites you can register your site on that's e-commerce it's mm-hmm. not you know it's directed people to your website mm-hmm. where the final sale is mm-hmm. everyone's got a website you know there's no point in putting these things up and not driving people to it yeah. And I think the bigger, the, bigger, the bigger picture of e-commerce is how do you get people to that final point? And I think they yeah. say six, six, or, <laughs> six or seven views of your business before they buy. Well, if you can get one, two, and three on different websites and then get them to your site, you've done half the work. And mm-hmm. then, of course, you have to set your website. There's no point in having a website for information. I don't believe in information websites unless you Google. You know, yeah. and they, 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 even they've done right out of things, I think. I'm not quite yeah. sure, but I think Google's done okay. But, of course, so, so you know, even they've got a, 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 um, a commercial side to it. But, of course, it's an information site, Wikipedia, an information mm. site. Yes. So, so everything relates. And then, of course, you get people on your site, and that's where you really need to. And people go to such expense on sites, and they, they leave out the biggest thing, which is say, buy my thing here. Now, maybe not as straightforward as that, but to book the event or to book. So I say to book Anything. a flight. Yes. Yeah. And they yes. leave it off and they put the phone number at the smallest part at the bottom <laughs> or their email address. You have to go. And, and for me, with glasses, it's no good, that is. And I just give up. And of course, if you have to look too hard, yes. you're not going to buy. No. You're not going to buy. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I like to think I'm, I'm savvy, web savvy, um, and, and commerce savvy. Um, but yeah, there's many people out there, and of course, that's where Veronica comes in. Because if you don't know, you don't know. But of course, yeah. Veronica's not trying to tell people to do things that they can themselves. Veronica's doing things that they can't do and not experienced in. Yes, but, exactly. But if I'm sure, Veronica, your job would be a lot easier if people did what they could do, and yeah. you concentrated on the real powerful stuff. That's good. It's like me with videos. I don't particularly want to do social media videos where they just they're out and about because they're not going to give me 300 quid, follow them around, doing a two two minute video of what they're on for tea. Yes. That's not the way yes. it is. They're not going to pay you three hundred pounds to put them on a directory. Yes. Of course, yes. if they put them on the directory, it leads them back to the site where you can do your magic with the e-commerce yes. right there. Yeah, exactly. And and so, but the and the biggest thing is that people don't realize is even if you get people on your website, there's the conversion rate. If you're lucky, is two percent. I've seen higher than two percent, but. They've, these guys have worked really hard to get higher than 2%. Most people get 0.5% conversion rate. So can you imagine how many people have to get, to, and I'm calling it a website, not, not an e-commerce store, any website to get that conversion rate. And so you you just have to get the people on to your site. Otherwise, it's a brochure. It's, what can I say, you know? Yeah, because one of the things I've always been fascinated by, and I'm curious of what both of y'all think about this, and uh, I've oftentimes found folks mm-hmm. with business cards, and I collect hundreds and thousands of the business cards. But one thing that I notice with business cards is that a lot of times they're filled with, uh, in my opinion, too much information. I mean, they've got like tons of information there. And let's see if I can get it so you can actually see it and everything. But they're just filled with all kinds of information. And you're sometimes wondering, um, are they putting too much information on there? So that's just some of the things that I'm sometimes puzzled by uh, yes. is the fact, there we go, I've got a better yes. view there. Yes. But they've got just too much information on it, and um, that's just something that I sometimes wonder about. So from an e-commerce standpoint, do you oftentimes find that happening, that you'll find folks that are just having way too much Ooh. information on yes. their business cards? So I just wondered yes. some of your thoughts on that, <laughs> because sometimes when I look at these business cards, I'm like, 
look, I just want kind of what Ben just came to from a marketing standpoint. I yeah. just want the basic information, what your service is, your name, how to reach you, and maybe a simple, uh, maybe a tagline, but it's kind of, but it's a very simple tagline, but that's all I want. I don't want like tons of information. I really hate the business cards and I've got one or two of those as well, where they almost give you an entire document on the backside of the business card. So like I said, this is one for a um, uh, chauffeur oh, company yes. and yes. everything like that. So they've got that, but then on the backside, they've also got that. So yes. like I said, I'm just going yes. like that way too much information in my opinion. So I just wondering from a sales point, what are some of your thoughts on that? Because I do think that sometimes our business folks get a little bit too carried away with trying to provide too much information. Although I must say that, so the, the rule is when somebody lands on your site, they immediately have to know what you want to sell, right? Or what is the message? What are you doing? Don't let me scroll. Don't let me look down. I want to know landing what it is. But, and then on a, on a, on a e-commerce store, I think it's essential to have some, what we call trust icons, which is your telephone number and address, um, able to contact you because otherwise you, you look a bit scammy, right? So, um, you have to, and believe, people think, Oh my God, you know, I'm going to get so many phone calls. Nobody picks up the phone. Everybody texts or they send a message. Nobody picks up the phone these days, unless they want to complain, by the way. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, have a chat. But that's all about communicating with your customers. So you have to have those trust icons. Yeah, too much information. You know, I had a um, somebody was saying to me, oh, yes, uh, somebody was, uh, I'm giving an assessment on this one e-commerce store. And she says, well, you know, I'm doing SEO. And I go, you know, and they're doing all these keywords and keyword phrases. And I go, okay, forget anything you've learned before 2020. Just chuck it out, throw it out the window, and then come back to me. And you need to have content on your website. And that goes with any e-commerce store as well. You know, there has to be enough information for your customers to be able to make a, a good decision to buy your products, right? So, but... So there's also a caveat with that. So you can have, you've got to have enough information for somebody that is loves research. They won't buy from you unless your information's on the website. Or you have to have enough information for somebody like me that goes skim, skim, skim. Okay, I'll buy this product. And if there's too much information and too long paragraphs and everything, I'll go, oh, my Lord, I've got to read through this. And I go, cheers, bye. I'm going to the next website. So you got to cater to to both of these types of uh, you know uh, types of prospective customers, so that you know obviously give them give them enough information to buy from you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You definitely have to do that on a uh, regular basis and everything of that nature. One of the things I was curious about, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on this, Veronica, is. There's the whole concept, and uh, Ben, you can jump in as well if you want to, about education and whether you need a business school degree. And I do agree that more and more people are doing e-commerce and doing kind of these entrepreneurship businesses, particularly in this age of COVID that we're living in and everything like that. But from your standpoint, as one who is an author and an entrepreneur yourself, and I definitely want to learn more about your early entrepreneurship. But that being said, how important do you feel it is to have a business degree, or do you think that it's best to learn from what they used to call the school of hard knocks? Well, I, unfortunately, I learned from the school of hard knocks. Let me tell you something. That path is pretty long because, you know, it takes, it takes time to learn everything. I, you know, if you can start out with a business degree, you learn to do research. You learn the, you learn the basics, right? Admit, I mean, they're not going to learn everything, but at least you can learn the basics and you come out with a toolbox of, 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 of information and tools that you can use to get your business to the next level very, very quickly. So, you know what? If you can do it, yes. If you can't, you know, just get in there and do it. Uh, you will learn. I mean, you know, but it just takes longer. Definitely takes longer. 
that makes a lot of sense. And like I said, I do want to learn more about your business and everything. And uh, Ben may want to jump in about the School of Hard Knocks because I know he's at yeah. the School of Hard Knocks as well. So, uh, but as Ben is talking, I am going to pull up because um, the fine folks at IBM.TV would probably punish both me and Ben if I do not bring up our online dollar store, which is one of our supporters and everything. We don't have Lynn to talk about it, but he oftentimes will pop in and everything. So I am going to share my screen and everything, and the audience will get a chance to see um, a little bit about the online the family dollar store because that right. is a sponsor of a lot that goes on at ibm.tv so i must go ahead and mention them as well so just as we have to share that and uh let folks see what uh that's all about because we do have the online dollar store and of course they are one of our supporters in the things that we do here so we've got wow. a variety of products and oh. things along those nature so mm -hmm. i did have to bring that up because this is a major sponsor of IBM.TV. So, Ben, if you want to jump in, I just wanted folks to know I, that we do have a dollar store as well. I, I would like to jump in. I'm, I'm totally disagree with Veronica. <laughs> I, and it might it might be the UK, it might be the different education systems, but I don't think education is geared towards entrepreneurship whatsoever. I think it is geared towards the JOB market, and JOB for us stands yeah. for ju just over broke. Um, <laughs> because because they pay you what they can, what they pay you just uh, they pay you what they want you to pay, not what you're worth. And uh, it's we need people to be employed, but we also need to respect our employed people, our employees. Um, we also, I mean, I work in the dyslexia. I do the dyslexia awards in the UK, and the people that run the the, the businesses are dyslexic, and a lot of them will, will employ the dyslexics, but they find that their dyslexic their dyslexia actually works well with theirs because there's different elements and they'll try and find other people that have different elements of dyslexia because dyslexia usually it brings out strong points in other areas mm -hmm. so so what they will do is if there's some somebody good with numbers or somebody good with creativity somebody good that's what they'll seek for and they know that dyslexia has got stronger elements of that because they're missing the, the, the one sense they make up for it in another sense um, so you wouldn't get that through the education system. You wouldn't get through that through, you know, they're not encouraged to do that. Um, you, you've heard it so many times. You won't succeed in life. Everybody can do a business. Not everybody wants to do a business. Everybody can no. do a business. And, and of course, I think it gets knocked out of a lot of people at school. I think that we just get channeled down this J-O-B route. And I call it just over broke again, but because it is. And, of course, they'll pay you as much as it costs to replace you. That's what you've got to yeah. consider. They pay you just enough. And if you're 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 replaceable, so you're only being paid what it costs to replace you, not what you're worth. So I disagree. I, I actually <laughs> wouldn't encourage my kids to stay in education. Um, to be honest with you, uh, past what they have to. Uh, and I actually think COVID nineteen has been a good experience. Uh, there's two ways of this. I think for five to ten year olds, it's been brilliant because they've learned to adapt, they've learned new skills, they've learned different things. However, for the thirteen to sixteen year olds, it's been a disaster because they come to the exams. Yeah, and of course, so, and of course, it's that big time. So there is two sides of it, but mine are five and eight, and I'm quite excited about what they've learned during lockdown. I agree. I totally agree. I've got grandkids um, at that age range, and also twelve. Um, but I, I agree, and I also disagree with you, right? With the education, but because there is, there is definitely, and I owned a recruiting company, so I place those people in jobs, right? But there is, I mean, there are, I've also learned in my life that there are some people that are entrepreneurs that will start a business, doesn't matter what happens. And then you get enthusiastic about people that have ideas and, you know, oh, my God, this is so amazing. Get it online. Get it. Go out there and sell. And they go, they just want to talk about it. So, you know, that's why you'll, you'll have both. But I found that my, my boys went to university here or college, whatever they call it here in America. Um, and they definitely learned a lot of stuff that I would have loved to have learned when I started out. And I've, I'm, you know, maybe because I moved a lot, different countries, and I had new careers in every country or new business in every country. But um, I don't know. They're, they're good things and they're bad things. Believe me, I owned half the bars in Waco where my boys went to college because, yeah, what can I say? 
but how many times when you're recruiting, do you tell somebody to take on such and such because they're the person they need, and they go, oh, no, we'll take on the next person because they're a little bit yeah. cheaper or something? Oh, that, yeah. That's frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Or they want somebody that that has a master's degree, and all she's going to do is sit at the front desk, right? It's like, give me a break. Or they, or they want it, and that was a really in 2008, 2007, 2008, and nine that – they needed to do three things. They need to be good at three jobs, not just at one job, you know. So they can, so they, they don't have to spend that extra money to, to employ somebody else. But how many business? Uh, sorry, Mark. How many business owners don't know how to do everything in their own company? Yes. It amazes me that does. You should know your own company inside out. Yes. And the amount of business owners that go, I don't know what to do. Well, it's like it's like they, they, they're more accounts. They don't know how to do the accounts, and they go on QuickBooks and type things in. It's all over the place. Right, the best thing you can do is get an accountant because they know what they're doing or a bookkeeper. Yeah. And it'll save you thousands of pounds down the line. And it's amazing the amount of business owners that don't know what to do. Oh, absolutely. So. But then the thing again is, you know, otherwise we wouldn't have jobs. That's all I can say. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm happy with that. That's very <laughs> true. And I can give you all an example of something that doesn't make any sense to me in the education system. Um, I was talking to Ben earlier about working for a company that does test grading. Uh, it's called Measurement Incorporated here and everything. But And they're a national company. But they require a college degree in order for us to grade the papers. Now, then... That sounds very logical that they require a college degree, but basically all they're asking you to do is to grade according to a rubric that they have created. I know, right? Grade according to the rubric. So if you're grading according to the rubric, it's kind of like being, uh, you know, a mouse in a trap and everything. So I don't know how much really smart you have to have in order to actually grade according to the Mm -hmm. rubric. So Mm -hmm. you're required a college degree for something that may not actually need a college degree in my mindset because if you have a high school degree you can even have the work experience of being in as ben was saying the corporate america and things of that nature where you've actually gained a lot of life experiences but because you don't have a college degree you're automatically ruled out of the pool of folks yeah. that can be the grading mm-hmm. so like mm-hmm. i said there, there's sometimes that those things happen that i don't quite get my uh, understanding of why yeah. they even do that or things of that nature so that's one of the things that i worry yeah. about but just uh, Veronica, in terms of your own background, because you mentioned being in different countries and things of that nature, one in uh, by South Africa, um, and I'm not going to mispronounce it because you just did a great job of pronouncing it. So uh, I'm not going to butcher that. And then I know you've lived in different parts of the United States. You've lived in other parts of the globe as well. So here in the U.S., the stereotype is the first job that somebody gets is the lemonade stand. That's kind of like the stereotype kind yeah. of rumor of people starting yeah. off at the first lemonade stand um i don't think i ever had one but i don't recall it but i know that that's what a lot of people started off with what was your first business that you started and how old were you you're a grandma now but how old were you when you first had your first business i think i was in my 20s and i was a master builder i actually built um houses and i had a whole team of builders that worked for me and i you know I did it for three months. <laughs> Gave it up as a bad idea. So I moved on from there. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I think, I think you're either that way inclined to own your own, but as I said before, you're either that way inclined to own your own business and you're always looking for opportunities. I played business when I was a kid. All my friends were my minions and I always was the boss and I always wrote out invoices. Very important. I was handing these out like confetti. But, yeah, you, you know, I, as I said, you're either that way inclined or you're, you'll always be in corporate wherever you are in the world, right? And I do kind of agree with what Ben was alluding to, which is that sometimes <clears throat> I think society in general does train us to be more in the workers' world and not so much in yes. the entrepreneurship world. Because yes. I do think Absolutely. that there is a number of times that we're kind of trained to get that minimum wage job, whatever the minimum wage is in whatever part of the world you live in, yes. and maybe get to a little bit above minimum wage. But that's about it. You're not encouraged to even, I would even argue, a lot of times you're not even encouraged to advance in that, you know, a lot of jobs. Yes. I think I think it starts at school. It starts in the schools where children are not not taught to be creative. They're taught to just follow the steps, baby. Just follow the steps. 
you have to do this, you have to do that, and the other thing. So, uh, yeah. Um, yes. There's nothing more annoying when, when you go to school parents' evening and they say, your kid is really good at reading, but they're not too good at writing. All right, go, go concentrate on the reading then. No, they need to get back. The, no, go and concentrate on the reading. If that's what they're really good at, make the best of what they're good at. Yes. But no, they won't do that. They try and bring everything up to yes. their force. Yes. Where yeah. they going to earn? I mean, if you think, where are they going to earn more money by being yeah. very good at something and not yeah. so good at other things? That's the way you earn the money. Yes, yes, exactly. And and here's a sad part as well. In America, education after school is incredibly expensive. All these kids end up with so much debt. It's just stupid. But and here's the sad part: they don't even use the degree unless you're an accountant or an engineer. That they studied, they they get a job completely out of their sphere because they come out of university and there's a recession or there's COVID or whatever's happening in the world. There's no jobs and they have to. You just have to take a job, right? So and then or you take the job and then you get promoted into something else because at eighteen, nineteen, you don't really know what you want to be. I mean, I've changed careers so many times. I still don't know what I want to be, but. <laughs> I don't. So you still, don't know what you, you still don't know what you want to be when you grow up. Well, exactly. You know, I'm still th- I'm still wondering about it. But <laughs> at least I re- at least okay. So at least I got to write my book. I bought my first um, how to write a book in my twenties. I still have the. I actually found the book in in the storage, and uh, I thought, well, you know, I've I've made it. Even though it's technical, I've made it. I've actually written the book. But you just don't know. I mean, you know, as I said, every experience becomes a tool in your toolbox. And then, you know, you you gather all these tools that you have and then you maybe hopefully then can get into a business that is successful, right? But I don't even know if we use the tools enough for those that have the tool set. Kind of comes to one of the points that Ben made and everything. Because just to kind of add to that, um, and this is not to say that this is a great thing, but I have my brother does work with quote unquote at risk youth, which is the youth that are kind of involved in gangs and other kind of things, maybe even the drug culture and things of that nature. Some of the best business minds, in my opinion, are also some of the most criminal minds. And if we could actually just find a way to channel that energy away yeah. from the negative stuff that they might be using it for into something positive we could create some great entrepreneurs. And I mean, there are being some great entrepreneurs created that way, but I just think we can do more of it in society. Because I do think that a number of these folks that are actually sitting in our prison cells in a lot of our institutions are actually great business owners and could actually do some amazing business things in life. So that's kind of my view is that they could actually do some amazing things if we would actually just train them in using traditional business models or even using their business models in order to mainstream society. But that's just my thought. I was wondering what your thoughts were, Veronica. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. I mean, you know, you have to be, it's, it's again, it's getting, getting back to the tools. We're not even educating our kids at school, and that's where it starts. That's where when these kids are not being challenged enough. I really think that children are not being challenged enough at school, so, uh, really – it might be a small percentage that then get into into an alternative path that could have been pushed into a different path, right? Because, as I said, my sons were not challenged at school. I mean, you know, and I believe that if you do, if you do school and you do sport, you keep that mind busy and that body busy. But I mean, and they probably smoked or did whatever they and drank drink. You know, as I said, I, I I probably owned half the bars at at the college town, right? But thank God they're now responsible people of 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 um, that, had, and they have jobs. But you know, it's just the, uh, and also it's opportunities. And then how do you how you grew up? If you have that example in 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 your family, I really think that helps a lot as well. I mean, yeah, my yeah. my my granddaughter at five said she wanted to own a fashion boutique. I said, "Hello, I'm with you, my baby." Yeah, I've never told my kids they can't do it. Yes. I've yes. never ever told them they can't do it. But you're right, though, about about the rougher areas of society. 
if they've got, if, if it is a rough area in, in regards to crime, etc., if you go give them a, a soccer ball or an American football, that is all they will play with, and that practice will make them better at that game. Yes. Whereas if they've got the computers around in the PlayStations, the Xboxes, whatever they are, and they play on that, they won't go and practice the sport. They won't no. go and practice the basics of life. And that is the biggest problem. And, and unfortunately, I don't know about the, the, the States, but the UK, we've taken away a lot of the playing fields. So they can't go out and practice now. They have to go to yeah. certain areas. And it's yeah. wrong. It's wrong. Yeah. Yes, I, I know why they, that, that some areas have had to be taken, etc. But mm. a lot of, the, a lot of the, the, the society issues are because the kids have got nothing to do. I totally Where, agree. I, I mean, my kids went to school in Holland and you had to belong to a club to be able to play a sport. And that's why we moved to America, because sports, as in South Africa, was is part of the school curriculum. You know, there's no, I have to schlep them to all these club events. So that's what I really liked here, is that they learn from a young age to play a sport. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, we all got our criminals, right? But uh, And kids that get into the wrong things. But yes, I agree with you. Absolutely. So what was the, just in your own business background and everything, Veronica, what is the worst business that you did, the worst, the business that you like, if you could take it back now, you never would have gotten into that business. And what do you consider your most successful business? But, but that's a two part question, but what's the worst business you ever had and what's the most successful business you ever had? Well, probably the worst business is probably being a master builder because I only lasted for three months. I thought that was a really bad idea. And um, I, I, as a white woman, young white woman, I was I had a team of black builders, and a huge. I mean, you know, was this the male and the female female problem? And then then there was the you're a white woman and you're telling me what to do. That's not going to happen. So I had all those problems on site, but you know, it was. That's probably the worst business I ever started. And it was an opportunity, right? Somebody said, hey, do you want to build my house? And I said, why not? So, <laughs> and my most successful business, I would say, is probably to date is my recruiting company. I was very fortunate to uh, snag some large companies. And I had um, uh, engineers, I, IT engineers, networking engineers all over the world. You know, they worked for Amex and um, we did all these networking things all over the world, which was very exciting. But um, so, yeah, and this one, I'm starting to make money on my book or 18 cents of it. Hello. So- <laughs> That's a good thing. So what's the business that you would love to get going that you don't have going? And also just since we got men over there in the, uh, the English area and everything, and you've been to Holland and uh, parts of the Southern African part, what's the part of the world that you would like to go see? Because this is IBM.TV and we're a global audience. So maybe there's somebody in that area that wants to bring your e-commerce business to your dream place to visit. So what's your dream place to visit? And also what's your dream business? My dream place to visit. That's a difficult one. I've, I have a lot. Um, I think, well, my vision right now is to get my boat. This is my boat, guys, behind me. Okay. I'm on a boat. My boat is going to go to the Bahamas, and we're going to do some cruising. So that's my place. And then um, what was the second question? Um, what's your vision for your most successful business? So what's your most successful business, what would that look like? Well, I'm doing it right now. This is what I would like to do. I've decided this might be something that I want to do when I grow up. And um, and it's teaching teaching people how to get their businesses online. I love coaching. I love telling people what to do. And, um, and I'm going to write my next book, so. To- to- totally wrong, Veronica. Totally wrong. <laughs> what, what, what? What your next business is, we're going to recreate Jaws, me and you, on your boat, the film. We'll recreate. Yes. We'll yes, make yes, billions. Yes. How about that? I'm, I'm me, you and Mark. You, you t- me, you <laughs> and Mark. We'll recreate Jaws on your boat. Yes, yes. We're going to do tours on the boat. I like this idea. We're going to have the tours on the boat. We're going to go around. We're going to replace the entire. Because, see, you have a smaller boat, and the big cruise industry is the big boats. So we're going to do minor boat trip. And retake the cruise industry. We could have a plan here. Oh yes, I think it's a great idea. Great idea. Because <laughs> we do know that that is definitely a, a troubled part of the industry right now is the cruise industry. Because 
That's oh. one of the industries that I know along with the airline industry have been heavily impacted by what's going on with COVID and everything of that nature. So we know yeah, it's been impacted. Uh, yeah. ben, you had a everything. But you're right, Mark, you're right. But nobody's got any sympathy for the cruise industry where they should have a lot more sympathy for the cruise industry than the, the aviation of the industry because the cruise industry isn't asking for handouts all the time and yet yes. make millions of pounds a week. And this is the, 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 the problem, going back to our earlier conversation, I'd, I've got a lot more sympathy for the cruise industry than the aviation authority, or the aviation industry I really have. And that's, yeah. it, it, it's, it's sad. Yeah. Well, I yeah. kind of agree with you on that, but I'm only going to give you one disagreement that I disagree with. I've only been on one cruise in my life, and that was with a uh, friend of mine, and we went not this past uh, Christmas or New Year's Eve time, because this New Year's Eve time, I was actually with my uh, dad and my brother and my nephews and several other family members of the beach in North Carolina. But the winter before, I went on a cruise with a friend of mine. And one of the things I don't like, and it's something that salespeople are very good at, but it's a negative aspect of salespeople. No insult to you and everything, Veronica. But some of the crew salespeople are some real aggressive salespeople, particularly the arts people, the ones that do like the art sales and they try to get you to buy their artwork while you're on the cruise. So they can be some real heavy folks because they're sitting there. I just remember every time I would turn around, there was one or two of them being like, you really want to buy that $1,000 picture? And I'm like, I didn't come with $1,000 on the boat trip. I you got $1,000 for me right now. What makes you think that I'm going to buy that $1,000 picture? But they would keep hitting me all the time trying to get me to buy. Like, it wasn't an Andy Warhol, but it was some popular um, modern artist and everything. And I'm sitting there going like, I already told y'all. I ain't got that money. I'm not buying it for my mom because they would also try to give you the guilt trip thing of trying to buy it for your family members and everything. So I'd already told them no a couple of times. And I know one of the tricks of sales, from what I understand, and I just want to know your take on this, Veronica, is that you never take the first no. And I think that sometimes those art sales people were a little bit too aggressive with that. <laughs> so what they what they should have done is, is the art of sales is tell your story, and know if you actually want to buy the picture, right? And tell you where you can use it and give you information instead of just going boom, 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 right? We, yes. Nobody likes the salesperson. Nobody. But, but Veronica, we're back in a loop here. We're back to the websites. We're back to the e-commerce sites. Yes. Tell, you, tell your story because there's nothing more annoying. But, but like you say, it's a balance because, like you said, tell your story, not your history. Yes. Because – you still want people. The key, to, the key to it is you want. It's a bit like the, the salesman on the boat. You want people to contact you, whether yes. that's a, whether that's a conversation back from Mark, whether that's the yes. core on your website. So yes. all with it, it's all the same. Sell your yes. story, and, and then and then yes. to spark the next point. Bang on there. Exactly. I mean, you know, and and I always you're talking about the business cards. I, you know, I was the networking queen in Houston about eight, nine years ago, and then I gave it up because I was in my boat and I was, that's it, I'll never go back again. But I would get all these business cards and then you just put them in the stack and forget about them. But the people that I remembered were the people that told me their story mm. of how they started the business, how their grandparents were involved. And I would remember, I would remember their faces, I would remember their stories, not their names. You know, you can fake that when you meet people. But it's the stories that I remember, right? So a good story. If you think of any small company or any people that have become very successful online, e-commerce-wise or any otherwise, it was the story that people bought into, right? And talking yeah, about yeah. Avi aviation, aviation, and what yeah, yeah. about the, the blonde guy? Branson. Yes. <laughs> it's the story, right? It's the story that makes him. Otherwise, it just becomes another airline. But he's, he's still continuing that story now, but unfortunately, he has gone the wrong way. When you own your own island and then you keep asking for government handouts, there's a little bit wrong there, I think. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but you are right. His, his backstory, it's, uh, and it's the same with that uh, Lord Sugar, Alan Sugar. He's the big one in the UK. His backstory, yep. he sold aerials out the back of a van. Yes. You can relate to that. Yes. And this is where Branson is losing now. You can't relate to somebody who owns an island asking for a handout. You can't relate to it. No. So he's losing the public's. Yeah. Um, he's losing okay. that part of the story now. So, yeah, you're right. The st story sell. 
Yeah, and absolutely. The stories definitely sell, and even here in the America, I mean, most people when they think of the fast food chains, they think of the folks that were connected with that chain, and then some of those have gone on. Like if you think of chicken, you think of Colonel Sanders and the yes. whole KFC thing yes. and everything. If he you think be, of McDonald's, became, you think of yes. Ray Kroc. He only became successful when he was in his sixties. Do you know that? The chicken guy. Oh, I did not realize that. So yep. He that. <clears throat> yep. Yep. He, he, he got rejected a yes. thousand, over a thousand times. Yeah. I think a thousand yeah. ninety two times. Yeah. Yeah. It's an amazing story. And so, and then, you know, if you think about uh, the pink lady uh, makeup, Mary Kay. Mary Kay. I mean, right. amazing what she's, what she's built as well, you know. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I actually saw the movie. I never knew who did McDonald's, obviously, until I came here. But I saw the movie of the McDonald's, and he was rejected, right? He he was like, you know, he was pounding the streets, and people kept saying no to him. Yep. Ronald. Yeah. Ronald. Yes. Yeah, Ronald. 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 Yeah. 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 Ronald's the mascot. Ray Kroc <laughs> is the actual person, yeah, and everything yeah. if I remember yeah. correctly. But um, coming back to e-commerce, now one of the negative aspects of e-commerce, I just want to know how you feel about this, Veronica, is that a lot of e-commerce is also tied into, not all, but you just mentioned Mary Kay, is tied into multi-level marketing, yeah. which has kind of a term that people like, but they don't necessarily like, whether it's Mary Kay, whether it's Amway, whether it's whatever. So I'm just wondering, what is your take on multi-level marketing as a business strategy and also as it's tied into e-commerce? Because most of those companies are do have an e-commerce element to them, yes. whether, like I said, the ones that we've named or even prepaid, there is an e-commerce oh, yeah. to it. Right. Yes, exactly. You know, they, they, fill a, they fill a need, right? So most people that start with multi-level marketing probably have a job and they want to make some extra money and they want to own their own company and it's, it's a start for them. They, you know, and there's always only a little 10% that become successful, but it's, I mean, you know, the best sales spiel, I, sales talk I ever, ever had was a multi-level com marketing company called Prepaid Legal Services. And I was mm -hmm. only schlepped there from my friend because she wanted to start it. And I said, all right, all right, I'll go with you. And this guy said, when you sell something and you, and you push that contract across the, across the table, you put the pen down and you keep your mouth shut. Don't offer special special things, right? But you know, it, it could be a, a, um, a breeding ground for hey, you know, I can do this. Maybe I can step out of it. But it's very easy to start it because obviously they're making money because they're selling your stuff, right? But it's a very easy way to probably just taste the entrepreneur if I'm not a risk taker. So if I'm not a risk taker, I'm not going to give up my job and my health benefits and my 401k, but I also want to dabble a bit, right? I want to, I want to experience the entrepreneur. Right. So, and you know what? I've never gone to conventions until I came to America. Oh my Lord, these things are nuts. I mean, you know, if they, you can, they can sell sugar to the sugar cane guys, you know, <laughs> you would buy anything, right? I mean, you would join the, Rah rah, and the ah, uh, it is just incredible. Uh, I mean, no, they are very disgusting. I want to hear from Ben because Ben I'm is actually of involved in the event planning business, and he probably can run a couple yes. of those kind of conventions. But I do have a share a story with y'all and everything, and I might be pressing the boundaries with IBM TV. But there are enhancement products of male enhancement products and everything, and I actually went to a um, a friend of mine told me to come to a multi level presentation. I was not sure what the multi-level presentation was. What I found out was that they gave this whole pitch. It was a wonderful pitch. They gave this whole pitch and everything. And in the middle of this pitch, the uh, young lady um, started uh, having making noises and sounds and things of that nature. And that's when I realized that the product <laughs> they were trying to sell was a female version <laughs> of this product and everything. But they were pitching it as a multi-level product. So that was just a little bit too weird for me because it was like, I don't even know the name of the company, but they were built in that multi-level marketing framework. And I just remember yeah. asking my friend, one, 
why did you ask me to come to this thing? Because it was a little bit weird and everything. And then dude, they were like, but you're a great conversationalist. You're a great talker. You know a lot of folks. You're a good networker. Exactly. Therefore, yeah. that's why yeah. we want you involved in the business. I did not get involved in that business. I actually have an aversion to multi-level marketing. That's yeah. just me personally. But that's just my aversion. But I just felt that it was weird. And like I said, I have been approached by everybody from Amway to folks trying to sell yeah. TV I products and multi-level yeah. marketing form but that was yeah. one of the weirdest ones and like i said that was probably almost <laughs> two decades ago and i'm sitting there going like okay and oh and it was at a university because it was at the the presentation was done at the student union of a university so that was already a, a weird location i bet there was a lot of different levels of different things in that <laughs> <laughs> I, I i i actually do do multi-level marketing as a backup business and like veronica said yeah. different different income yeah. decisions i do something called utility warehouse in in the uk which is phone broadband gas electric and mobile yes yes now, the thing is is that i've never mentioned it before on ibm tv because i don't come on ibm tv for that i come on because i'm a podcaster yes. I'm a podcast yes. Where a lot of, and also where a lot of people go wrong is they take it as a business, full time business for a full time yes. job. Now, yes. the key to multi level marketing is, I, in my eye, this is my opinion, it should always be full. Uh, it should always be part time, and when yes. you get successful, it should be super part time. Because if I came to you now, Veronica, you've got your own business. I say, Veronica, come and do this with me, and you go, well, how how often do you do it? And I say, well, I do it full time. You go, well, I've got the time. Yes, and then also yes. you come out of what you're doing and you take it on full time. I've yes. got pressure on me to replace that income. Yes, straight yes. away I'm on a loser. Yes, and of course, and like you said, Mark, people are quite sneaky about it. It's yes. all about people. What I do, yes. is I have, I've got, I've got, I've done, I've done relatively well out of it. I've got a car. I've had five years of mini, brand new mini. I've never had a new car in my life before. I've had holidays with the business I'm in as well, Utility Warehouse, but I do it part-time. I don't go to a meeting about media and then say, I do gas, because nobody has ever got out of bed to do gas. (laughs) What I will do, honestly, I've I've never found the person that gets out of bed for gas or electric. Yes, yes. Find a a broadband maybe, but not gas and electric. Yes. What I do is I listen. I've got two ears, I listen. So if you you suddenly put on Facebook, oh, I'm really racked off with my energy bit company they've overcharged me i say look i do a business it'll cost you a cup of coffee i'll bring the biscuits should we sit down and see what we can do or yeah. I've, or I've, I've lost my job or my job's under threat look i've got a yeah. business that might help you yes. all it'll cost you is a coffee and of course these days it won't even cost you a coffee it's over zoom yeah but that's because but uh, even my business my industry gets ruined by other people because yeah. they give false promises yeah. It, is, it is a business. It's a different way of business. And Mark, yeah. I totally respect that it may not be your way of doing business. But the fact is, is that you respect the industry because you said it can be yeah. beneficial. But the problem is, you see, is that a lot of people get into the, the cult mentality and say, you've got to join my business. You haven't got to yeah. do anything in life. No. You've no. Got- no, that's very true, uh, Ben. And I, I'm hearing your point and everything. And what I was going to add to that is that I think that's my issue with multi-level marketing, to be perfectly honest about it and everything. Is it too often, um, we've had this conversation on IBM.tv and on some other platforms that I'm part of and everything. I am involved in um, two primary jobs because to me, there's a difference between a job and a career. So my yeah. job is to pay the bill. So like I said, I mentioned a company that I do with the test grading. I also work at a cultural arts center. So sometimes they are related. So I also work at a cultural arts center, but those are the ones that help pay the bills. To me, a career is something that you have a passion about. Like Veronica has a passion about e-commerce. So a lot of my yeah. stuff around entertainment and around media, I consider that more of a career. Like I love doing this. I wake up in the morning. First thing I do is probably crunch the computer to see what IBM.tv is doing and some of our other things that we're doing that are culturally based in everything and also a little bit of activism because even to me that can be culturally based so that means that i've already got a limited amount of time in the day meaning that like the 24 hours if i'm doing everything that i just described that's probably about 18 to 20 hours so uh, what my issue with a lot of multi-level marketing people is is that they don't understand the time constraints and they try to get you to almost like they, they kind of give you this argument that like, no, don't worry. It won't impact your other businesses. It won't worry. It won't impact your other businesses. You'll still be able to do all of that. I only need two to three hours of your time and everything of that nature, which yeah. I don't find very realistic. So that's where my issue is with some multi-level marketers. 
So the, yeah. the, the other problem is, is that you cannot run two businesses. I'm sorry. I mean, your one business has to be take a back seat, right? It literally has to be residual income because concentrating on building your business takes so much energy. Plus you've got, cli- I mean, I've got clients, I've got workshops. Um, and, you know, so to building my own business takes all of my energy, right? So you have to, I've, I had a, um, um, I've had several CEO coaches or business coaches in ever since I've been in America. I didn't even know they existed before I came here. But she said to me that our brains are like, you know, as entrepreneurs. And we everything is, oh, my God, now maybe I should try this as a new, shiny new object. But what we, sh- we should focus on just one business and have another business here on the side behind us. But it can be bubbling along, right? But you can't concentrate on that. You will literally not succeed in either. Yeah. So there has to be one main focus. Yeah, my question to that, though, and this is, like I said, I don't know the answer, so I'm here, curious to hear y'all's take on this and everything, is I hear what you're saying about you need to concentrate on one business. But a lot of our greatest business leaders, and no matter what you think, I'm not a fan, and I've made that very clear yeah. on the show, but no matter what you think about um, Trump or Mark Cuban or Richard Branson, who we mentioned earlier, and a number of others, they don't really have, but they have a business umbrella, but I don't know that they necessarily have one business, because like That's I said... You. They do. If you really look at their business, you will realize what their main business is because you're seeing all these businesses that they have that is under the umbrella, right? Right. But their main business is whatever they need to do, and they concentrate on that. So the success of what they're creating underneath that is what everybody else sees, right? So... It could be Mark Cuban investing in business. That's his main business, right? He's investing in businesses, make sure that they run properly, make sure that they do well, and either take over or do whatever he does with them. I haven't really got into him much. But just just, if you notice what they do, they do have one main business, right? And, and, I mean, people will say, oh, you're talking nonsense. But it's physically impossible to think – so maybe if you have teams, even they're not, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're always coming up with different things. So they have to literally relate to each other. So also notice the really successful people have a main business, but the businesses that they have underneath are related to the main business. So I guess one of the questions I'm going to ask, and I'm, like I said, I'm going to put it away from you, Veronica, I'm going to pull it to Ben, because Ben <laughs> um, and me have become friends on Facebook, and he sent me a list of these different businesses. So Ben owns more than one business. Of course, as you can see on the page and everything, those of you that are watching on YouTube, he's got Moogie's Media, but he's also got some other companies that exist as well. So Ben, I would think that you would actually say that you have more than one business. Am I wrong in thinking that, or do you think that you only have one business the way Veronica's talking? I have one business. I have Mooges. It's called Mooges Management, and it's one business. The media is a brand of that. We've got my wife's blog, which is Mama to Moving About, she concentrates on. I've got my uh, – my daughter's got a YouTube channel, which is uh, training – she's only eight. She knows more than me. But she trains dogs, and all I do is produce her videos, so I'm still doing the same, still doing commercial uh, creative content. The, the utility warehouse business is part-time, and it's in the gaps. Yes. But it's not something that I create gaps for. If there's a gap there or there's mm-hmm. an opportunity, I will, I will go there. But it's not something I can concentrate on, but it is a residual income. Yes. Um, I, 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 what I tend to do is I promote other businesses. Yes. So if I've got friends that have got other businesses, I will promote them. And yes. I, will, I will promote my customers. A lot of the things I promote on Facebook are my clients. Now, yes. I've just recently done a, a, a glamping site. And I've, all I've done on my on one of my pages is I've put on the pictures I took while I was doing this video. Mm. Off the back of that, I've got two referrals for him. Mm. Yeah. So, so I'm actually not doing different businesses. I'm doing one thing. Yes. yes. I'm doing it consistently, successfully, and promoting my other businesses because then I, a lot of people are too worried about keeping their things to, close in their chest yes. so they won't tell you who mm-hmm. to deal with. Mm-hmm. I, Whereas that glamping site, I'm happy for people to see. I'm confident in the job I've done. Yes. I, I created in two referrals. 
Yeah. So if another video company approaches him and says, yeah. oh, well, I, I could do that for you. I say, well, can you get me referrals as well? Now, yeah. you've got then got to do the proofs and the pun if you can do that. So yeah. I'm a great believer. I believe and if I make enough other people successful, I'll be successful myself. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I definitely agree with that. Yeah. That's the uh, thing that I think most successful business people do. And that's one of my beefs. And it's just my personal beef with some of our, um, particularly not all, but some of our people in the entertainment and the cultural world, particularly in the minority field, is I think that they've done a great job of raising themselves and raising their business. But I don't know that I see enough of that reaching back kind of mentality that I like to see in yeah. society. So I would like yeah. to see more reaching back from some of the folks that have made it. And that's across the board. I mean, it has nothing to do with yes. color. It has nothing to do with class. It has nothing to do with gender. I just would like to see more people that are successful actually reach back because I do believe in that kind of concept of reaching back. But one of the other things I was just curious to take y'all's take on and everything is with COVID and everything, we started getting this, uh, and it was going on, I think, even before COVID, uh, this kind of popularity of gig economy and gig jobs. So in that case, I think people are doing multiple jobs. I'm not saying they're doing them well, but they are doing multiple jobs because they might be going to their regular job. I've got a dear friend that she has her job of being in a call center. That's her day job and everything. But as soon as the job ends, at like let's say she's doing nine to five, and I don't even think that's her shift right now, but let's just say she's doing nine to five, maybe give her an hour to take a break and get dinner and do things of that nature. About six or seven o'clock, she's going into the gig work and doing that for another three or four hours. So I do think that because of the gig economy and because of folks trying to survive in these hard economic times that we are in, we are finding people that are doing more than one job. And I think that that's being forced on us because of the gig economy, but also because of the nature of the new normal that we're in and the ways that computers are taking over to some degree our life and things. But I was just wondering, y'all's take on that, and I'll start with you, Veronica. I, you know what, and it's the same thing with entrepreneurs. You know, if you have an e-commerce store, um, I always say focus on one product, not just one, but a niche product. But you can always have that underlying product that, you supply to your customer that actually if they buy this, then they can also like, they would like this part as part of the product. So you can, you, I mean, the diversification is the, the world, right? You have to diversify what you're doing and always be thinking about what else can I do? You know, maybe supply them with boxes where you go to $1 store. Hello. And put things in a in the box with your product, and off you go. You know now you've got gift boxes. You know so you got to you got to. I mean I'm thinking outside the box, right? <laughs> That's such a cliche, but you literally have to think about okay. So what else can you offer your client, but still focus on your main? Is that did you, did I answer your question, or did I just go off into a tangent? No, that answered the question. And I was talking <laughs> about the gig economy, but I was just wondering your thoughts yeah. about how more and more of our folks in the world, I wouldn't even say the United States, I would say it's global, are becoming yeah. more gig economy based because I use the example of uh, definitely yes. Um, yes. Uber and DoorDash and a number of those kind of companies. I don't even think I named what the companies were in the earlier comment, but yeah, yeah. that's what I've seen. I was more of those gig kind of economies. Yeah. And I do think we started going into more of a gig economy kind of mentality. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. But it's the same thing, you know, I've got clients who have a job, are teachers, and they're starting an online store. And it's the same with, you know, if, if you were driving Uber, you know, you have your job and you go home, eat, and then you drive Uber. It's also just complementing what you're doing as a, as, as a job. And then hopefully you can actually do a transition. And if you can't, then try something else, you know. I mean, it's the same with if you were, um, if you have a job and you were doing multi-level marketing, right? It's just that that income, that extra income that you can supplement Plus, you get a little bit of, you know, excited because, you know, ding, 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 you know, here comes some money flying in. So, <laughs> so I mean, you know, this is not everybody um, is a risk taker, but you, you just need to do what you need to do. If you, if you can't have, if you can't be an entrepreneur and you can't afford just to be an entrepreneur, maybe you should get a job to complement trying to become an entrepreneur. There is that that balance that you need to get as well because yeah. you have to eat, right? Yep. Yeah. So for both, for Ben, I want to hear your take on this. And then I also, this is a question and I'll start with you, Ben, is 
what advice would you give to folks that want to be an entrepreneur? So I'll start with you, Ben, and then I'll okay. come to Veronica. But okay. so folks that are watching and hearing this whole dialogue we're having, and they're thinking to myself, I really want to be an entrepreneur, what advice would you give them? So firstly, I think the gig economy, I think there's two reasons for the gig economy. I think firstly is necessity, and like yeah. Veronica says, to put food on the table. And that's quite a sad situation. And we're back to what we said about job, about they're not paying you value, they're paying you what they, they want mm-hmm. to. Mm-hmm. And I think the second thing is it's a passion. To go into that yes. second job, it's a passion. Yes. So um, my passion for my second job is not particularly the, the gas and electric. I said it's the holidays, it's the car. It's yes. the brand new car. It's that goal. Yes. And I have to have a goal. Um, so singers, musicians, the passion is the music. They don't go to yes. work because, you know, a lot of people go to work to pay the bills. They then yes. do their second job, which is what brings the gig economy around, because they're passion. Musician. Yes. Very rare a musician can make a living out of singing. Yeah. To be honest, there's some that you don't think want to, you don't want to make a living out of singing because they can't <laughs> sing. But that's another question. But a lot of the good ones, the, the wedding singers, they do that because that's their passion. They don't yes. particularly need the money. They're usually in half decent jobs because they're on slightly entrepreneurial, etc. But they do it because it's their passion. Yes. So th- that's the main two reasons for the gig economy, and there has to be a reason. Being in multi-level marketing as I am, there's lots of people that have joined, have, have become part of the team that didn't need it and they've done nothing and they've gone into hiding. They've been, you know, witness protection and you can't get hold of them and everything like that. And that's fine. They, they, they haven't, they didn't have the, the guts to tell me they didn't need it. That's yeah. fine. That's the way it is. Yeah. And I think you can already tell I'm not one of these gushy people that, that jump up and down at the, the seminars, etc. I'll sit there and, I'd rather sit. I don't like spilling me coffee at any time. So, yeah. No, it spills your coffee. That does run. It don't do that. Um, but so, yeah. But, you know, you have to get to know people. And, yeah. and I, I don't I don't like signing up people that need it. I'd rather sign up people that want it. Yes. Because yes. I can work with people exactly. that want it. Yes. And, and so, so that's the difference. So that, that's the, my answer on the gig economy question. People that want to become an entrepreneur, um, do you not like sleeping? Um, because <laughs> can't. Um, I can't. I, I, I say go for it because if you don't, somebody else will. And and also, don't just and, – and this is why I did Utility Warehouse because it was right at the start of my entrepreneurial career and it was a great backup. Your yes. network marketing is a great backup and a great safety net. Yes. But – this, this, this key to being entrepreneurial is have, don't put the, all the pressure on yourself because you, you've still got to eat, you've still got to pay your bills, you've still got to pay your rent. And two is enjoy it, do something you enjoy. Don't just do something you don't want to. You have to enjoy it because that's that comes out in the business. And the other thing is get good people around you. And I do a lot of networking and I do BNI. Uh, and I do BNI because it's bloody good other business owners that I can work off and work around and you'll never know everything but somebody yeah. else will know something or they'll know somebody that does so get good people around so there's, there's my three keys really um, but yeah just do it just give it yeah. a go give it a go if you're in the right position give it a go because if you don't you'll only regret it yeah, yeah. that makes Absolutely. a lot of sense what's Absolutely. your advice is, is I exactly I agree with uh, I agree with Ben I listened to a record, a record, right? Okay, when we had records, was a um, a Jewish old a Jewish psychologist. I have no idea who he was, and I've always remembered this. He said, you know, and obviously everybody else now repeats it. But if you are a year down the road and you haven't started it, you're going to be sorry because you're going to look back and go, I should have done it. How many times have people said to you, I should have done it? Just do it. Yeah. Baby steps, right? Do a little bit. Do just test it out. You know, have see if it see if it fits. You know, otherwise do something else. But just start. If you just start, and it's a low cost. You do an e-commerce store. It's low cost. You can get print on demand. You can do um, drop shipping. I mean, you can literally get into the market at low cost. But the you, you know, there's obviously a lot to it, right? But just do it, you know. And if you don't, you're going to be a year down the road and you go, I should have done it, you know. I should have. <laughs> right? 
it's interesting to bring that up because that's actually something that we've brought up on a variety of these shows here on IBM.TV. And I've even brought it up myself because I've been guilty of that, where you're sitting there and you're like thinking, I should have gone for that job. I should have gone for mm -hmm. that career. I should have gone for this entrepreneurship thing. Even sometimes when you've had partnerships with folks, even relationships kind of things. And you yeah. said, I should have done this. I should have done that. And then, like you said, a year down the line or when the person's actually got the job that you felt you guys should have gotten and you're regretting it. So then you're sitting there going like, woulda, shoulda, woulda, shoulda, coulda. There's the old yeah. expression and everything. And I think there's way too many people in society in general do that. They yeah. do that woulda, shoulda, coulda kind of attitude. So uh, yeah. definitely I'm thinking more and more people are doing that on a regular basis. And that's something that we need to stop having, stop having that kind of attitude where folks are doing woulda, coulda, shoulda. Um, if you would really quickly, Veronica, and I think we've got about another 10 or 15 minutes to go, I would love if you would tell folks about your e-commerce store and your book and where we can get the uh, book and everything of that nature. So if you would let folks know that as well as the, about the store. And so I've definitely this is the time for you to do a little bit of marketing of your own. So I would love for you to do that. Who knows? Uh, Ben might decide to buy the book. So if you would share that with us, because me and Ben have already decided that we want to buy your um, boat. We don't know how we're going to buy the boat, but we at least want to rent the boat because the boat was really nice. Me and Ben have been both admiring the boat from our respective cameras, so we might be just had to join you on a trip on the boat. We did see that there was a uh, another gentleman that was there. I told that's your significant other, so we might just have to kind of like crash on the whole family there and everything. So, so I, just one more thing about an entrepreneur. I totally believe that you should be in a group of like-minded people, but also get a coach, do the easy thing, talk to somebody that knows what they're doing, and, you know, because you're going to have several of them, but get moving. Anyway, so my book is on Amazon. It's called Shopify Made Easy. Um, is it free right now? No, I think you have to pay. I can't remember. It's $2.99 or something. You know, it's, it's we're playing the Amazon game. And it was bestseller, and it was a hot seller, baby. So, um, <clears throat> so, <laughs> and so, what else? And right now, and so I, you know, I do, I do Shopify, I do e-commerce, I migrate, I up, upload, I advise, I, you know, whatever you need to get your product out to your customers. And you can always check me out at veronicajeans.com. Very easy, very simple, no other name. Um, I'm branded. That's, I thought myself, you know, I'm going to become famous, baby. Show me a camera, show me a mic, and I'm there. So, <laughs> so um, and that's it. That's sounds wonderful. Uh, ben, I think that, uh, like I said, the IBM.TV family knows about you and everything, but, uh, you know, we sometimes get new listeners that are not always part of the IBM.TV family or they're becoming part of the family, so I would love for them to know more about uh, your business as well, and uh, who knows, maybe you've got a uh, conference coming up where you can hire Veronica and things of that nature, but I'm sure she would gladly come from Texas over there to uh, yeah. London to participate in the conference. And by the way, um, Ankit, one of our lead producers, did say hi to all three of us. He said, amazing show and interesting discussion. He did say that he missed you earlier this morning, Ben, because I don't know if he was expecting you or one of the earlier conversations, but who knows what's going on with Ankit and them in that sense. But he did say he missed you. I ditched him for you, Mark. I ditched him for you. Don't tell him, though. We'll keep all that right. between the three. All right. Um, no, yeah, I, I, I do. Um, now, just media, we are an event. Uh, media agency, we do a lot of events. Uh, we do. We, we create content. What I don't like seeing on social media is the old Monday motivation or Wednesday wisdom post. Personally, I've never seen a Monday motivation post that's got me going. Uh, it's never, ever got me out of bed. Uh, I think it's quite... Uh, Person, I think I think I've, I think I'm in the right room here. I think it's quite lazy. Um, so I like to create content. So we 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 do a lot of event management mm. media. For <laughs> he is watching. Ankit's just put his watching. I'm in trouble now. I'll probably get banned. I love you, really, Ankit. I missed you as well. But yeah, what we do is we do visual content creation. So we do a lot of events. So we go to events, and we we're a great believer that good event organisers should be really busy looking after people. They shouldn't yeah. have time to do the media. They shouldn't have time to interview people. So we'll go and do that for them. We'll create the memories for them. We'll create the, what, the, the, the legacy for them. And also, if it's a two-day event, three-day event, we're very good at getting the material out on the first night. 
so people can see what's going on the second night. We do the usual videos, so we do a lot of website videos. And as I said earlier, we're doing a lot for holiday place at the moment. Uh, we have a drone with drone pilots. Uh, we qualify drone pilots. And one thing we have done during lockdown is we have, I have become, well, obviously, podcast host and started doing a lot of appearances on IBM TV. Now, it's I love podcasts. My podcast is called The Entrepreneur's View of Business. And you're only allowed on if you're positive. That's one rule. You are vetted before you get on, and any negative answers you are cut off. No, I'm joking, though. But um, <laughs> I like I like positive people because there's enough negativity on the uh, income producer machine in the yes. corner of most people's room. So if you want to see negativity, put on your news channel, do all that. I talk to positive people, and I tell what I like my guests to do is to tell people how they can do it and that they can do it. Recently, Veronica, and I said this at recent, I had on, on another program on the channel. I had a guy on who had, had 27 brain operations by the time he was two. He's in a wheelchair. He's got spina bifida. He's got another uh, um, capacity reducing disease. I can't remember what it is. He said it. And he's, 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 an he's got an entertainment business and he's going to survive through COVID, even though he's been locked in his home and literally locked in his home, couldn't even let his parents in for five or six months. The only people collecting was his carers. That, to me, is inspirational. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And, and the key to that is, when I interview him, just shut up. Just let him talk, because I can't yeah. tell his story. Yeah. So so that's what I do. I love positivity. I do want everybody to succeed. Um, I never tell my kids no. Uh, they, they, they don't accept no anyway. I think we all know what kids are like at times. Um, <laughs> Uh, and yeah so it's it's all about positivity it's all about creating content it's all about getting it out there and it's about enjoying it because if Absolutely. you can't because trust no, me no. when i'm flying yep. the drone when i'm flying the drone i love it it's the editing and i'm sure you both know that it's the editing of things that oh, you don't always yeah. see i know i know yeah, yeah i yeah. know that's the hard part i don't know what I, I don't know what you're thinking ben but I think that uh, we may have found uh, two things going on here, and we are getting ready to wrap everything up. But I think that we may have found, and I have to check with Ankin and everything, but um, I think that for your podcast, we may have found another guest for you because Veronica definitely is giving us this positivity. So I'm thinking that she can definitely uh, be one of the positive folks that you could have on your podcast. And one of the things I'm going to talk to Ankin about, and like I said, Ben is involved, as am I, but you definitely have that great energy, so we might have to see about getting you a show here on IBM.TV as well to talk about e-commerce and business and things of that nature. So, like I said, I'll talk to one of our producers, but we are trying to expand our program in here, so I think we definitely have one opportunity for sure, which has been show and possibly some other things here on IBM.TV. And by the way, Ankit, who is still keeping a steady watch on us, us said that he wanted to know how is London to you, and then uh, he also wanted to know um, being best English native and a positive soul. So you definitely had that great thing to say about you. So. I've got a teaching that UK is not just London. Uh, I, I, I tell you, I, 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 just because of that, I will fly to India myself. I, I you know, I had necessity for about a month and talk to him about it. No problem at all. And uh, Veronica, don't think that Ankit, our producer, wasn't paying attention to you as well. He Woo-hoo! said that he would like to invite you to come on our Business Masters. So we have a show called Business Masters, and he would like to invite you to come onto that. So definitely we will reach out to you about that. But you are invited to another IBM.TV show to talk about business and things of that nature. So just wanted to let you know that you are being heard and being watched. So I want to thank both of you for being guests on the show. It's been an amazing conversation around business and around life and things of that nature. I definitely, um, just to be honest, and I know that Ben was teasing you earlier, I've been just admiring that boat the whole time. So I am definitely <laughs> very jealous of that boat because I'm thinking that, you know, I didn't know that being an entrepreneur could lead to you getting a nice boat that can go around the ocean and everything's of that nature. So yeah. apparently the key to being an entrepreneur is that you can get a boat because I don't have a boat. Ben. Do you have a boat, Ben? No, but I'm just wondering now if we can, if the program ending could be the Jaws music today. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. This was so much fun, guys. I'm glad I met you. I'm glad I, I actually popped on. Yes, it was a pleasure. Definitely look forward to it. I'm going to put on, unfortunately, there's no Charles music. I'll put on the <laughs> new brand, uh, both intro and outro that they gave me. And they gave me like some E.T. character. I don't know what Angie was thinking about oh, we love E.T. character, but it was kind of cute and everything. 
of that nature. So I'm going to put on my um, radio show with Mark Lee, intro and outro, and then from there we'll wrap it up. And I've still got one more IBM.TV show to do. And speaking of podcasting, Ben, I've got to do the more traditional podcast of audio later on this evening at 7. So I've still got two more shows to go. So definitely we're going to wrap it up with this uh, outro and then uh, we will come back with the other show. And then, like I said, at 7 o'clock, I've got my show on Blog Talk Radio. So once again, I do want to thank Veronica and Ben for being my guests on this particular um, afternoon. So great conversation and a definitely enlightening conversation. So for those of you that are watching it in the reruns, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on Twitter, I do think, or Twitch, I think that you will learn quite a bit. So right now, here's that intro, outro, and that's what we'll use to wrap up this particular edition of the show. Ready?